Yeah. I'm here with Terrence Martin and uh, the uh, writer, director, co-writer, co-director of Get Away With You Can't, uh, along with co-star, along with co-writer, co-director, co-star uh, Dominique Braun. And uh, I guess we'll start off with that. Um, so you did one movie, uh, The Donner Party, previous to this. And uh, yeah. and then uh, years later, you come up with this. And by the way, th- this movie is great. And we'll, we'll get into why uh, later on. But oh, um, what uh, so what what's it like with just the two of you making this movie? I'm sure there's more people, you know, cameramen, people behind the scenes and stuff. But I mean, oh yeah, two we writers, two directors, crew. two two actors. It's like just the two of you, like kind of. Yeah, the idea the like idea this. was definitely spawned from my first film, The Donner Party, to give you like a little bit of um backstory on that, like. I had written a, uh, I, I'm most, I would say I'm most comfortable as a writer. And I had written a, a, a script about mountain men in the 1840s. It was actually the exact script of Revenant, but told from the boy who leaves Hugh Glass in the wild's point of All view. Right. And, it, and it got a lot of traction around Hollywood. It, it didn't get made, but I, people kind of want writers in Hollywood to just be very d- dismissive about their material. But I'd spent like a year researching this time period and I wanted to make this movie so bad. I wasn't ever interested in like going up for another writing assignment. I think Scooby Dooby 2 was one that a, a, a development executive was talking about, you know, possibly giving me the, the power to interview for. But I was so into the story that I said, like, what was this? I just spent a year writing. The manager wants me to just forget the script. It's not going to sell because Alamo had just come out and didn't make any money and no one was going to put the kind of money into it. So I said, like, I'm going to write a story set in this time period that I can shoot myself. And it was called The Forlorn. It was about a group from the Donner Party that snuck off to rescue the rest. It wasn't about the entire Donner Party. So I'm just very passionate about it. Everybody I talk to, I'm like, hey, I can do this super cheap, like open water. I'll do it on my own credit cards if I have to. about a week later, I'm at a party and a producer overhears me. He says, hey, let me read this. I think I could get this set up for you. We're sitting in the production office the next Monday with the team that's up for the Oscar that, that year telling me we're going to make this movie for like $5 million with a book of actors. He's just like, pick your two leads. They're great. So I picked Gary Oldman because <laughs> he's fucking fantastic. Because yeah. And I thought we could possibly get him. I didn't want to go for, you know, Brad Pitt or, and you know. So I, I picked Gary Oldman and Barry Pepper because it's kind of like two people I saw playing the role. And they're like, no problem. Boom, send it out. Both want to do the movie. Love the script. I'm like, oh my God, my Hollywood dream is coming true. But a year passed. They didn't commit the money to the project. And I finally told my producer, I'm like, hey man, I'm just going to do this, act in it myself, do it non-SAG. And he said, no, 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 I'll get you a couple hundred thousand dollars. So we were lucky enough to have Crispin Glover step up because he was going to play another character into the lead. And my friend Joey, Clayne Crawford, who you guys know, I think you've interviewed him, um, to play the other lead. But to get that 100000 I had to give up Final Cut, which I thought, hey, my producer's pretty cool. Like, of course, he's going to let me take the lead when it comes to editing the film. I wrote the story. All the actors want to do it because of my script. But as soon as we finished, he just said, hey, get out of here and like went into a shell of only he could make the editing decisions. And it was like having your baby like ripped apart in front of you. I mean, I never had so much creative pain in my life because I had put everything into this. It wasn't like I was getting paid a ton of money. The whole payment of the, of the movie was that I got to tell my story, you know? So he managed to put together the movie that it is. And I'm happy when people like it, because I do think the performances are right, but I always felt like a strong disconnect from, what the final product was, you know, even when I saw it sell to Showtime and was an early streamer on Netflix, I, I would read people's comments and say, yeah, exactly. That's like, you're right. I would not have killed the main character, you know, like, I don't want to ruin it for people, but you know, it's based on a true story. And I felt like we really needed to respect the people who, who really lived it. And it was put together with no sense of that. So it was uh, absolutely hard. Real quick with that. What, what, what were some of the, some of the uh, changes that they, they made? That, that you well, weren't really privy to or didn't really care for? Yeah, killing off characters that didn't die in real life. And it wasn't that there was like a person who wanted to buy the movie that was making these suggestions. It was just this person, the producer's taste, yeah. which which didn't make any sense because he could have let me edit it and it still would have sold to the same place and gotten the same. But it was just 
him going crazy. And I get when people, pe people put their own money into something, it, it can be unnerving, but I feel like in the independent world, you got to trust the vision you invested in, you know? Yeah. Um, Spe and, especially and when it's as relatively cheap as it is. I mean, not, it, yeah. it's still a lot of money in the grand scheme of things, but like with, you know, relative it, it to a, other budgets, I think it's. Yeah. Relatively cheap. It went from like a five five million dollar movie at that big production company that won the Oscar to a couple hundred thousand, but the couple hundred thousand was was very scared money. And um, I, I at that point was really ready to make the movie, but I, I would never take people's money when it's it's too this industry is too crazy. Like if people are trying to like invest in something, invest in real estate, you know, to make money. But yeah, movie movie is a gamble. <laughs> But I think in the independent film world, filmmakers can learn, like, don't give up the final cut of your first film. Like, if you're not making a ton of money, and it's not some studio giving you a huge opportunity. What you're getting paid is to tell your story and show yourself as a director. So if you lose that, you know, hell? it's basically yeah. a, a waste. I love when people like it because I think Crispin Glover's amazing in it. I think Joey's amazing. I think all the actors Clayton are amazing. Crawford. Yeah, <laughs> Clayton, yeah, he's joey to me we <laughs> we I, he was one of the first people i met when i first moved out to la we oh, were all real? just struggling writers actors there was a guy who like let us live in this building near koreatown for like 600 bucks a month like for these little studio apartments and like just kept, like kind of gave struggling uh creative types a place to live and and we we, we shared that that building um so so yeah like he stepped up and but but um i just it's it's a real heartbreaker because I know how good that movie could have been, you know, yeah. and it would have been quite different even if I had just edited it. I think it would have been quite a bit shorter. It would have moved faster. You would have understood the themes, the main character, the whole bone of the story was like his loss of religious values as he kind of like turned into this primal, you know, uh, killer in a way, you know, and, yeah. and the justification for that. But anyway... I, I Oh, yeah. real quick, what one thing I want to point out with the Donner Party and get away with, if you can is that the uh, like like the beginning of the Donner Party, for example, um, it has like a bunch of text and text and voiceover, and both with the Donner Party and get away if you can, you're really strong in telling a story without exposition or without so like when i'm watching the donner party at the beginning, like it's it's it has all this text like saying stuff that happened. I'm like. I, I don't think you really need that there because like I'm, yeah, watching the thing, I'm watching the thing yeah. i don't know all the details that they're giving me but i don't think i care i just i know what this person's going through i know they're stuck in this situation and kind of yeah. like i i get enough of it and then and get away uh if you can it's a lot more quiet movie and and yeah, you're just uh, thrown yeah, right it, in and you have to you have to figure it out which is yeah. kind of counter to like what Netflix does a lot is like this voiceover where, you know, the person's sock size, their favorite movie, <laughs> you know, if they like to bowl or play ski ball, like, you know, everything. He was about a 27 that. women's with 36 situations. <laughs> yeah. And I get it. Cause in the idea of streaming, if someone doesn't like the character, they can go so fast. But I, I do like to just be in a quiet moment and kind of get a sense of the people before I'm told what they are. And I wanted that for the Donner party. I, I fought hard against the voiceover, but again, I, I didn't have final cut. And um, yeah, I, I appreciate that way of storytelling. Both, both can be great. You know, yeah. I, I also, I love the voiceover at the beginning of Goodfellas. Don't get me wrong. Like that's pretty amazing. Um, so it's, it's a convention that can be great, but in, in this case and, and in getaway, if you can, I really wanted people to have to say, Hey, do I like this person? Do I care about them? Why should I care about that? I wanted all that to flow as you're watching the movie in a, in a, in a more um, open kind of way. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. Uh, I, I guess kind of got away from it, but uh, uh, Dominique Braun, like how did the two of you get together to make uh, this one? Well, I had just fallen head over heels in love with her. And um, I, I, she had studied acting in New York. She had studied acting in Argentina or directing as a, in uh, Argentina as an undergrad and acting in, in New York, but she had quite a bit of famous friends that had really bad experiences in the industry. You got to admit in the mid two thousands, it was like Harvey was the main producer that people aspired to be. It was a, hopefully it's a better place now, but it was a dangerous place for, especially someone overseas to come and try to make their mark in the acting world. And she had so many friends with bad experiences that she, she pursued other things in life. But 
when we fell in love and she saw I was a director and I write every day and movies are my passion, I started to develop a story we could do together with no end date. So it was just about making a film we were proud of. It wasn't even to get it distributed. So uh, this, this was the idea. And um, she, when I knew I was going to marry her, we took a trip to Chile and Argentina. And I said, hey, you know, there's this island that Robinson Crusoe, the, the book is based on the experience of the sailor on this island. Like, what do you say we just go there on a vacation for a couple of weeks, but bring a film crew and kind of develop the start of this movie. And that's all the island footage you see. All right. So it was very experimental. Like that, that boat scene where we're fighting was the first thing we shot. So we, we used that as the catalyst for the next scene. It wasn't like I was just locked into like one piece of text to be the movie. Um, which is another unfortunate part about filmmaking. Yeah, of course, like a great script can can turn into a great movie, but when you're when you're on a low budget and you and you're dependent on the script too much, sometimes it can be a, a huge letdown because you're not able to capture. You don't have the money or the time to capture the depth that that was on the page. So in our case, we're basically like riffing off one scene to another. We had a framework, and and, and it was a joyous way to make a film. But you know in the end took seven years. But that more had to do with waiting on our actors and Ed Harris and Martina Guzman and, and, and those, those elements. I mean, how many members of the crew did you have uh, on the, on the Island scenes? Cause I, I, the, I, I imagine it'd be island. like a, it'd be like a, you know, uh, you Dominic can be like a, uh, who are, uh, Lucio, I guess is a cinematographer. Yeah. Like, 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 like grab one of the cameraman and go, Hey, uh, just, just us three. Let's just go and do this. <laughs> Well, Lucio, an assistant for the camera, because you need someone to pull focus. Right. Uh, I wanted to bring an editor because I wanted to be seeing how it was put together as we were going. We didn't do that on the first one. And it was you're just so overwhelmed by footage that I like to make films now like that you're at least assembling it as you go. And you can watch and think about maybe go reshoot a scene if you didn't get get the tone. Right. right? So I brought an editor and then uh, a one man sound machine. So who was really, really talented. He, he held the boom and operated all the sound just with a, with a chest package. Huh. But it, it, so it was a, it was definitely a run and gun type operation and the boat captain as well, because you needed a good boat captain, because as you see, like we're shooting a lot on open water Yeah, and that all had to be synced up. We use walkie talkies and we hire a lot of local people from the Island. There's like a lobster village on the Island. So we got in there just before lobster season. Once lobster season comes, everybody's working, working, working. But we got in there like two weeks before, so we were able to hire a lot of the local guys to help as well. Did the did the shoot go pretty quick for the most part? Um, did what? Like, like, what? Well, with like with such a small crew, did a did the shoot go pretty quick, or did you have any trouble? Yeah, I mean, I mean, we knew we had like I think what was it? We had three weeks. So so for an independent film, that was more. I had twelve days, twelve shooting days on the Donner Party, and that's a SAG production with limited hours. So for me, it was like we had all the time in the world, you know. Like plus, we didn't we didn't like have to nail a, a perfectly written script, you know. We were riffing, so. So I thought it was amazing, you know, like I, I thought that time period was way easier than like when we had Ed, we had a very limited time. So I would go to his house and work on the, the lines with him and I would try to get in as much prep as I could because, you know, that was that was when we had to go union SAG, which is which adds quite a bit to the budget. And, you know, with his busy schedule, he was kind enough to give us days, but I would have liked another week with him to really, um, really explore his character. Yeah, I mean his, his character was pretty. Uh, I, th I, th I thought his character was pretty good in that. Well, not, not, he he was for the amount of time we sure. shot. He was a, an a hole for amazing. sure, but like it, it was uh, he, he played that a hole well in that. Yeah, yeah, and and um and and for me, it's like an impression of a father. It's like it's, I'm sure there's a lot of good sides to this to this character, but it's the whole story is about all the negative the guy does. So that's what you see. We, yeah. we actually shot a lot of bonding scenes of him and I working and you get a sense of like what we do. We're like a tugboat operation that works in Long Beach. And he was like really frustrated with the computer. But when you when you like the man too much, it it didn't gel well with the climax of the story, you know? Yeah. Because because it felt like, oh, he's a pretty cool guy, you know, and some fathers are not at all cool. And they really or anyone in life that pressures other people. 
And I wanted to show those people and the negative impact they can have on on a, on a child's life or anybody who who comes in contact with you, not even your parents. Yeah. Well, I, I mentioned yeah. earlier that like a, a lot of uh, a lot of your work and this especially um, is like kind of uh, silent scenes. Uh, you know, the, yeah. What what, the what does a what does a what does a script for this look like? Is it just is it just action line action line action line or or do you yeah. put in, you put in dialogue yeah. and then just choose not to shoot it on the day? Well, I spent like fifteen years like really trying to sell scripts in Hollywood. So I I think part of this movie is me frustrated with that process. So I started this with like a loose framework. I knew some of the beats I wanted to get to, but I didn't tie it into dialogue to get there because I knew my wife Dominique was so good at improvisation that we were gonna find the scene and then it would lead to the next scene. So we had whatever, 40 scenes and a, and a certain arc to them, but with no dialogue. But then when it came to Ed, I went and did this process with him beforehand, like improvised and we kind of came up with stuff. And then I scripted it out because I only had such a limited time frame. Yeah. I didn't I didn't want it just to be like, we got one scene because with this process, um, you gotta give a lot of time and a lot of, a lot of shooting. Um, I think I, I I didn't know beforehand, but it's very similar to the way uh, Terrence Malick shoots his films. Like yeah, everything's I, really I, open. I've heard about that. Yeah, I read a report actually after we made Donner Party about an actor who worked on one of his sets. And I was like, he's even more extreme than me. Like sometimes he doesn't even have a framework. He'll just give like an actor like a little note card that says, try to make that guy laugh. And that will be the whole day of shooting. You know, <laughs> they'll just keep, you know, he's he's earned the the money and the time for that. Um, but I do, I know on the next one I want to be a bit more formal and and maybe even like go like Hitchcock style and storyboard everything out beforehand. But it was really a fun way to make a film. I I really um, I really felt good about it because there's no wrong answers um, when when you're doing it that way. You're just discovering, and that's a, a fun process. Yeah. Well, also like one of the great things about this story here, and I, th I suppose we can talk about it, but like, uh, it, it seems like the story that we're watching is not the story you're telling. Like the, them trapped on a boat's not them on the trapped in a boat. That's them in, trapped in the relationship. And then she goes away to the island and she's free, but still trapped in a way. And then there's, yeah. you know, the, and so there's like a lot of, uh, there's a lot of double entendre, double meaning, uh, metaphor in here. How much of that yeah, yeah. was how much of that was preconceived and how much of that was kind of like you say when you find stuff while you're shooting and how much of this was like uh editing and go, oh, you know what, this yeah, kind of works. I think that was a huge part of the conception of the movie. We had um she she had been in a previous marriage and we had a lot of friends that that um did not seem happy in their marriage. And in a way we wanted to like see if there was anything that they could ever get to bring out that happiness. So when people see the movie, sometimes they're like, whoa, like you guys must get along, not get along in real life. And it, it, it couldn't be further from the truth. We get along great, but we're we're playing characters that are really at a rough patch. Most love stories begin, they meet, they fall in love. There's some trauma, they fall back in love. But we wanted to like throw two characters who were like at, right about ready to divorce, you know, and to see if there was any way and structure it like a thriller. I'm really playing with the thriller genre, right? Like when, when you get into the movie, you think, oh shit, like anything could happen, I hope, you know, like murder. I even introduce a gun, which is like what they, I know the rule, of course, if you introduce a gun, it's supposed to go off, but maybe it is, it is maybe get, it isn't. It is called get away if you can. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't yeah. scream horror thriller. I don't know what does. Yeah, and actually our, our distributor Brainstorm really loved the thriller aspect. So they marketed it as like a straight thriller which we were kind of pleased with because if you marketed it the other way, I don't think the twist in this case would come through because you would already kind of know what the movie was getting at. Yeah. Um, I know it upset some purists uh, in the genre, like, cause they were really hoping for, for the beats of a thriller, but I hope some people, and, and they were because they email me and find me on Instagram. Um, we're, we're pleasantly surprised that it takes a turn away from, you know, what the genre is supposed to do. Yeah, I, I well, I think with like stuff like that, because you know, I've seen like uh, uh, movies where like I thought it was one thing, watch it and turn out to be another thing. I think, like, uh, just from my own perspective, if I see that and the thing that it turns into is interesting, 
I'll usually yeah. be like, okay, I can go with this. If they if it's sold as one thing and the thing it turns into is like, oh, you just went for low hanging fruit and this is like stupid, then I'm. But but then again, that that comes to the quality of the movie and my taste. So I I guess it doesn't really matter one or another, but. Yeah, definitely. I think it speaks to how people watch movies. Um, sometimes you just want a ham sandwich, you know, and, and yeah. sometimes you this movie is not that it's a bit more challenging. You have to give a bit of yourself to the characters and to what it becomes. And um, if you're in the mood for the ham sandwich, don't watch our movie yeah. at that time. It, you know, just go on more of a lobster and, roll. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And what like uh so I'm from the uh, East Coast, so I appreciate that reference. Like my <laughs> town is like known for lobster rolls. Well, I, I I just know that uh Dominique's character, like you're like, oh hey, yeah, yeah, hey, yeah, I, yeah got, totally. I got you fish, and she's like, I'm eating lobster, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah. <Scram. laughs> yeah, that was a funny moment we discovered there because you know where we were shooting was a huge lobster town and lobster season just started so we just see these boats roll in just loaded with lobster and basically for the last week all the crew ate was lobster every day because yeah it was not only cheap it was like so plentiful yeah. so um how, how do you how do you go about like raising money for uh this one because because you mentioned the donor party but get away if you can it, like yeah well, well, on this one, I, I didn't at first want to take any money because I didn't want to be whole. I wasn't going to give a final cut. And generally, unless you really have a track record of, of, of amazing films, you're not going to get final cut. So I, I, we funded the island portion ourselves. I, I was playing poker at the time and doing really well. It was like right in the poker boom. So I just put a percentage of the winnings aside for the film and, and I did it myself. Um, it was a bit more with the SAG, so we took a loan from from some friends. But you know, it's hard when you get money involved. Like we had made a deal from the beginning. Hey, this might take a long time, and by a long time, we mean like seven years. Like we're in no hurry, and they're like, yeah, yeah, great, great, great. But then the time starts ticking, and they're like, hey, like we gave you this money. So right before we um, were about to take it out to the world, I, 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 you know, we we bought them out and made sure everybody was happy and nobody took a loss. And we didn't want money hanging over our heads when we released it because it was such a beautiful experience for us. And now it's doing well and we found a great distribution partner. And I'm really excited because these days a movie comes out and has a seven year life, you know, with all the different streaming platforms that pick it up. I just saw Suits, that show is like having a new life on Netflix, finding a whole new audience, you know, like, I think that's beautiful. It used to be just opening weekend, you know, and one of the good things about streaming is, you know, there's um, so many platforms and so many different audiences. I'm really excited about Tubi because, um, you know, that's a, a whole audience that maybe can't even afford to, to, to buy a film for a couple bucks and they can just watch it for free. And we started our exclusive with them um, sometime before the end of the year. Yeah. Um, so that'll be fun. So uh, you mentioned the distributor, like uh, everything I know about distributors is that they're uh, shady and they're crooks. Like, <laughs> what, What's been your experience with that? Yeah, I mean, mostly they're shady, but because there's there, it's so easy for them to cheat filmmakers. But yeah. I, I had a really good production attorney. That was an, a, another thing. On Donner Party, I didn't use an attorney. It was just all handshake stuff, you know, it was, and I got like the best production attorney for independent film he represented like palm springs which i think holds the record for the biggest sale at sundance and and i just wanted someone who really contractually had my back um and he said hey i've been working with this company brainstorm for years and um you know they're not a24 like they're not gonna put a huge budget into marketing your film but if you're willing to get out there and talk to movie lovers like yourself you can do really well and they're going to be straight with you and i spoke to michelle there and we both agreed like like we're going to get the truth from them and that's that's the hardest thing yeah. and i encourage any filmmaker to really do their research call people we call lots of filmmakers who had films released by them that that's kind of the key because if somebody if you call another filmmaker and they're like hey i haven't gotten one statement I wasn't able to consult on my poster then just run away. You know, these days you can just do it yourself. Rather there, than deal with some. Are there any uh, distributors that you can uh, kind of do like, like, like with your lawyer, you just, you uh, pay your lawyer, whatever the fees, and then they do the work and then they're done. Then you don't have to pay them anymore. Like, are there any distributors that do that? Because from what I understand, 
it's, Hey, you put in all this time, all this risk and all this money and, you know, got everything together, put in all the work. And now you have the movie made here. Let me put it in this box and I'll take 50%. Like that, that just seems like, yeah. it, it well, seems like, it seems like a service you should just pay for. Like here's however much money distribute the movie. And well, I think it's tricky because you don't want to have to be paying a distributor. They're the ones who are handling the ties to like Amazon, iTunes, yeah. And and if they have a lot of other films, they can't just send you their their statements. So you have to really trust their word on how they are. Um, but but yeah, I mean, I've heard of filmmakers who on the really low budget side going going with um, Film Hub, having good results with them. Yeah, um, they're just basically like an aggregator that you you give them all your materials and they they through computer means distribute your movie, um, and. Um, apparently that works for some people we thought this this movie needed a human touch though you know yeah. they had put out quite a fil few films they just purchased a, a really hot movie out of toronto this year and they had put out a movie with naomi watts called the wolf hour which was a, a big sundance title so we knew that they they could put out a movie with care and love and that's the main thing we wanted you know you yeah. never know how it's going to do or perform but you want people who care about the project putting it out a lot of distributors like say they're going to do all this stuff, but then they just throw it up on the platforms, you know, throw like a poster that makes it look like a total B movie and hope for the best, um, which. Yeah. I'll, so um, you're talking about kind of how people feel about get away if you can. And I'm looking through the uh, I'm looking through the, like the IMDb reviews. Oh, and there's not many middling reviews. They're either. <laughs> I fucking love this movie or fuck yeah. this movie in its ass. So it's like on, on, on one hand, like hearing bad reviews have to feel bad, but when the uh, reviews are that, that disparate from each other or, you know, that you, you know, we, apart. we wanted to challenge people with this film. So it's very interesting for us. We, we'd rather have a passionate bad one than like, Hey, this is another shitty movie. That's just like every other movie. Like I love that we got some passion out of people. People started to say really nice things about our movie, especially on YouTube where we premiered our trailer. And there was a dude that just came and started attacking everybody who said something nice about our film. But he was clearly very moved by the movie because he would go into why I should resolve things with my father. Like he had clearly given it a lot of thought, um, you know, and, and I just thought, wow, like to evoke that kind of reaction. And, and then people were like coming to our defense saying, no, no, you missed it. Like he has to turn his back on the father. Otherwise he can't. And that that was our intention, you know, but he couldn't he couldn't get behind it. So so actually, yeah, like um, it, it, pro it probably touched him more deeply than he realizes. I think so. And maybe later he realized, OK, cool. Like uh, if the movie gave me this much fire, like it's got to be worth something. Like I've always felt like even if I didn't love all the artistic choices in a movie, if it made me think it, it was a successful movie, Um I, I tested movies for years for the studios. I would get like Harry Potter be, when it was a rough cut and go to Chicago and recruit an audience. And I found that audience members, their first reaction to a movie, sometimes if it's hard or challenging, they say bad, but they don't mean bad. They just mean like, I don't know how to process this. Yeah. So it, it takes a bit. Kubrick's films were like that. Look, man, 2001, when it came out, got bad reviews. Like for me, that movie is like the most rewatchable movie in history. I could watch that movie and I'm not a huge rewatcher of movies, but I rewatch 2001 once a year because I see something different or beautiful or, oh, wow, he means this. There's an ambiguity to it, you know, which I hope our movie shares at least the ambiguity part. I'm not going to compare at all our film to 2001. But, you know, Mother is another one. Did you see this movie? I love Ed, Mother. Ed I love it, too. Yeah. Uh, that, man, that, I, I saw Mother in the theater and I was yeah, sitting in the, like in the back left where I normally do. And yeah. uh, uh, is the movie because I, I wasn't quite sure what to expect. You know, I knew it was Darren Aronofsky, yeah. so I'm watching the movie. And then as the movie's going, I'm starting to like eyeball the people down in front. And then the movie yeah. gets done, and people get up and like, "What the hell was that?" I don't yeah, all, all pissed <laughs> off. Well, yeah, I, man, I'm I, mostly confounded. But <laughs> well, there was a lot of pissed off people. We we were members of the Soho House in L.A. and the the curator they had a movie program there with like a private movie theater and the curator like went online and just blasted the film. And I thought like it was the same person who would like complain about too many Marvel movies. And I thought like how irresponsible, like 
even if you didn't like it, like this is an art house movie done yeah. at a huge budget level, like at least appreciate the heart and the passion, even if you didn't like it. But I was really um, upset with the critical response to that film because the the studios just aren't going to pull the trigger on movies like that if they don't, um, you know, if 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 people hate on them, you know. So we're losing a lot of really interesting cinema. I I loved in film school when I when I started to watch like films of Godard, you know, in the new way where they would just do crazy shit and you'd be like, whoa, like I didn't even know films could do that. Like really impressed. And I tried to include some of those touches in the Donner part. I mean, in a, in the Donner party when I, when I shot it, but in, in uh get away, if you can, when we edited it, like there's a point where the camera actually moves and I got criticized for that, but it's intentional. It's meant for you to go, Oh shit. Like just get uneasy for a second because she's alone on the Island. Like, and it like draws your attention to like something quite jarring, you know? And it, like, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't, but it's not a mistake. Like people were saying it's a mistake. How could he leave? Speaking yeah. of camera moves, um, and maybe this was a lot easier than uh, than I think, but it seemed like it was a difficult shot. But you're doing this. Oh and yeah, that, and hard. there's so and, and then there's the yeah. the, the, the you, you know what I'm talking about. There's a tent yeah, yeah, like right it. in the middle of it where, where she's across the island. Yeah. Like, nope, too high, too low. All right, another take. Nope, a little oh, too low. Like how how, yeah. how how long did that take? That was a hard one, man. Just for that one shot, I think we probably spent half a day lining up because she was across a whole channel of water. And then in, in post, we had to like really bump up the colors on her jacket so you could actually see her figure and find it really quickly. But I, I like I like that shot a lot too. It, it was it was definitely a, a challenging one. Yeah, that was a, that was like one of those undercover ones. Like a, like even as I'm watching it, like it didn't click right away. And then pretty much after the after that that scene passed, I was like, wait a second. <laughs> They had to line yeah. the camera up with that. Like, how <laughs> I, yeah, how, how do had, you do that sort of thing? I I, I, I like those undercover ones where it's like, it's real brilliant, but it doesn't hit you right away because it's not a showy scene, but it's not until you reflect on it later that you're like, wow, they did something there. Oh, yeah. Our, our, our guy that we brought to um, the island is named Lucio Bonelli, and he's one of the top. Argentina has like an amazing local cinema. They make, I don't know, 40 to 50 movies a year. And he's one of the top DPs out of Argentina. He just did a movie called The Extortion, which is on HBO Plus, which was their biggest hit in, in many, many years in the theaters there, which I really recommend. Yeah, he's he's a, he's an amazing DP. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, you said you write a lot. Um, is it going to be another, I, I hope not, but is it going to be another 13 years so you get to make another one? Or <laughs> or like, like well, um, and... If you don't know, that's fine. But like, if uh, if I handed you a blank check right now and said, "Go make whatever movie you want," like, what what would you go out and do? Like, yeah, you know? well, man, I don't have Are a blank we, check, uh, by the way. This is all hypothetical. Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would make uh, another movie with uh, Dominique as the star. I wrote a, a script about um, you know, kind of a going to a fertility fertility clinic in like twenty years time, and the company's kind of nefarious and. And that process gone wrong. I see that idea kind of popping up more, but I wrote it many years ago, but I, I thought she would be amazing about this woman that gets this kind of baby inside her. But I saw like American Horror Story is doing that. And there's a movie called The Pod that just came out kind of yeah. about that. But my my take is more akin to Rosemary's Baby on it. So that would be my number one go to if I got like a, a decent budget for a film right now. But but basically, I've been focusing on a novel for the last many, oh, nice. many years. Yeah, Oliver Stone wanted to do a movie version of an early version of it. Uh, it's not the same thing it is now, but it's definitely my piece of writing that's attracted the most attention in Hollywood. And it really needed to be a novel, not a script, because it's just a long, deep story about fathers and sons in 1969 and the Vietnam War and the nature of man and war. And I'm a surfer, so they're all surfers and yeah. and uh it plays on a lot of themes of get away if you can, but much, much different. And um, actually it's far. Yeah. I, I've always wondered this with the, uh, sir, cause I've never surfed before. Um, uh, yeah. in fact, I'm not a fan of just going in the water in general, if I can't see the bottom, but there's, you probably there's watched a, jaws too many times. <laughs> no, no. I, um, uh, I was, 
I was like tubing um, in one of the lakes in uh, Nebraska and uh, you know, I fell off the tube and I was waiting for the boat to come around and something big just brushed against my leg. I don't know what it was. I'm like, get me the hell out of here. And then never again. Yeah. I I mean, it's probably like a catfish or something, but yeah, luckily I grew up like my front lawn. I grew up in this teeny little house, like in uh, West Haven, Connecticut, right right on the long island sound so my front yard was just uh beach and water so it's like yeah. um, as natural to me as anything oh I but water yeah uh, what, what it, was your question what, about what i wanted yet? to ask was uh the uh surfing it, it has like a real spiritual aspect to it but i've never yeah. seen that i've never seen that i, I guess i kind of saw it portrayed in the point break remake because like there was a way they kind of explained it I'm like okay I, I think i get it but like as someone who surfs like can you kind of explain what what, sure, that, yeah. what what that kind well, of feeling is point break kind of confuses it with adrenaline which is part of the surfing experience but it's not the whole thing like there are guys who ride like those giant waves like the 100 foot wave series i don't know if you saw that on hbo those guys are adrenaline junkies they get the pleasure of surfing but i'm like i just like riding waves even if they're small like you kind of you kind of lose yourself. You lose all, it's like a drug experience in a way, but very healthy, you know, you just become blank of mind and you're just cruising. And then you're like, whoa, that just happened. But you're never thinking about your responsibilities or what you have to do. The surf riding a wave lasts maybe like a minute at tops if it's a super long wave, but you just come out completely cleansed. Like that's why I think surfers get this reputation of being like all spicolied out. Because when you get out of the water, it's like you're really stoned. You're just like, oh, yeah, cool, man. Are like, trying to snap you, back into reality? <laughs> yeah, well, your brain is just like like you've been meditating for, for hours or something. So I guess it, it it's hard to quantify exactly, but that's what it is for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, maybe I have to try that something. I, I, I guess I got kind of some of that, like riding a motorcycle up in the mountains. You're just yeah. kinda, You're just kind of going and just but yeah mine, mine goes blank and then just kind of going about it but it, it seems kind of similar to that yeah athletes say runner it's like a runner runners even get a high from it after a while i i did track and was the captain of my track team in high school and i, <laughs> I never got any runners high but for surfing i really get it right away it's not for everybody it's so hard man it's not like snowboarding where you just go and you can learn in a couple of days like it takes a year of intense work to to even start to get into surfing yeah yeah I, I wonder, is it uh, like the mechanics? Of, I wonder if that's like part of the meditation to where you can't think about what you're doing. You just have to let your body do it. It's like, yeah, play, because play, everything's playing drums, so for fast. Exa- yeah, yeah, playing drum, is- for example, if you think about what your right arm and left arm and right foot and left foot's doing, you're just going to yeah. get jumbled up and mess it up. You just have to kind of do it. Yeah, you, you got to do it. That's how surfing is as well. Yeah. And that's for me what good writing is too. Like when I'm really zoned in and I'm pulling, oh, yeah. it's just like flowing. It's like you're tapping into some kind of, uh, I don't know, something bigger than yourself for sure. Do you get the, uh, cause I hear people talking about like writer's block and I, I would say just write through it. You're going to write crap, but eventually it's going to, it's going to kind of come back in. Do you have any sort of like, what, what's your kind of process? Like if you get stuck on something. Yeah. I, I like to think about it a lot. I like to um, at least write for free for, for an hour a day where I'm not uh editing but sometimes in the editing i'll say oh my editing brain my critical brain will say that's not working and i won't be able it's not so much writer's block but i won't be able to figure out how to make it work so i'll take my time with it i'll take a break you know i don't i think a lot of writers just push through and they become hard and miserable when it's not working for me i just put it away and you know walk with my dog or go surfing or something like that and generally that the answer will come to me later but i i I don't like sitting in front of the computer writing and feeling like this sucks. I can't figure this out. I just put it away. Like I do this whole work for joy, not, not for struggle. Um, there's enough struggle that comes from trying to do it well that I'm not going to put myself through any manufactured struggle. Yeah. But you talk about a high, like but it, it, you got a scene, like you write it and it's like, Oh, I fucking nailed it. Oh, I, nailed it. <laughs> I wish I could yeah. show someone to read this, but no one likes reading screenplays. Fuck. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's kind of the ego part of it. Like, you, you definitely feel that too. Oh, yeah, I should get an Oscar. But but for me, it's like when you like kind of just discover these people doing these things, and it feels like so real to you that it's it's like it's it's like you found it or something. It's yeah. like finding a treasure. Um, but yeah, when you do it well, you're like, okay, cool. Like, 
but but that part is like more ego which i try not to get involved with with the writing i try to like um just just make it real and true to what it has to be um rather than say it's right or wrong you know yeah um yeah well i i guess uh i guess we'll end on this um I, I had a great time talking with you by the way yeah me too man <laughs> you, you, did, you, cool you handled your hangover very well man i would have never known <laughs> no I, I got in the interview high so the inter- the hangover just went away yeah, but uh we we do have the what's in the box segment where we have people put in uh movies that uh they think are underseen that they really like or maybe something doesn't have to be underseen maybe it's a very well seen but it's personal to you like what's a movie you'd like to put in the box well I guess I, I hope it's on Netflix in the America too, but I noticed the other day, um, Martina Guzman, who plays the sister of Dominique in the movie, she's a, a top Argentine actress. And um, I noticed her husband, who was a top Argentine director, had a retrospective on our Netflix the other day. His name is Pablo Trapera. And they did they made a movie called um, uh, Elefante Blanco, The White Elephant, okay. um, which, which, which is about the Vijas in Argentina. There's these giant cities that had developed out of just how homeless encampments like hundreds of thousands of people live in them and and they don't own the land and it's about this phenomena in argentina and it's really a great place to start with this director pablo trapero if you look on your netflix they had five of his films just playing as almost like a retrospective and he made a movie called crane world which is black and white about an argentine worker it's absolutely amazing and lion's den and i would start with uh the white elephant and go from there and discover a, a foreign foreign uh director that really knows his stuff all right yeah cool um one last thing i meant to ask this earlier but we got we got so wrapped up in other stuff there's a full frontal scene is that all you (laughs) yeah 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 but the congratulations (laughs) no no but the idea it's it's funny you ask about that it's kind of a spoiler warning i guess for people who haven't seen it but i don't know about you but when i would see sexual movies when i was younger And it would look like the actor like just came out of a cold bath. You know what I mean? Yeah. There was no charge, no nothing. Like, and we did not want that. We wanted it to feel like a really charged up moment. And I think maybe because of the, the fear of the X, that's why it was like, you have to be careful with that idea. But that was the idea is it like felt very believable. Um, And um, I hope it did. I we've gotten a lot of comments that said it, like one one reviewer was just obsessed with whether it was real sex or not. Like he, uh, we did an interview with him. Well, whether it was, was or I mean, whether it was or not, it certainly felt that way. Like the the yeah. intima- the intimacy and the sexiness and like the the desires all kind of come through in ways yeah, that for, usually it feels it feels titillating in right? other movies, but this it feels more realistic, which I well, guess generally- could be t- titillating, but it's, it's definitely realistic. Well, yeah, I I, th- I think of it like, you know, when you watch those films when you're young about like tribal New Guinea or the Amazonian people and they would be naked, but it felt very real and good. It didn't feel exploitative. When you watch sex scenes on most movies, like the camera moves super slow and the skin is glistening. And the the backlight light. and the smoke coming. Yeah. <laughs> the and saxophone music thought, like, in the back. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. I did. We didn't want that at all, you know. <laughs> I, I I would I would like to kind of maybe someone does like a supercut of this with all the sex scenes with like MacGruber sex music in the background. Yeah, uh, it, it could be a thing, I guess. But I'd be fine with that. Uh, anyway, Terrence, uh, thank you for joining me today, and uh, come back no on anytime. I'd love to talk to you again, uh, and uh, let us know sure. if you got anything else coming up in the future because we'd like to see it. Right on, man. I appreciate your. Uh, helping film and talking about it every yeah. week well with yeah. this one it's easy <laughs> it, yeah. it, it's like if i watch it it was like oh no <laughs> yeah i imagine that must be tough <laughs> I, I had i had to do that once and it you know it it wasn't fun but i mean that yeah. that's it's kind of like a part of just reviewing movies i guess but yeah I, I noticed, it, 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 if i don't like something i like to try to at least figure out who would because it's like this one's not for me unless unless the movie's like uh unless i think the movie's irresponsible then I'll well i know it. as a as a filmmaker i'd rather have someone say from the beginning hey man i had issues with your film can we talk about that yeah I, I might say yeah sure like as long as it's like a good spirited conversation i think mark Marin does a good job you can kind of tell when he doesn't like 
the product that the person came on because he'll kind yeah. of say, so what are we trying to say with this? You know, there's a way to say it without being hurtful to the person because because it's all subjective, right? Yeah. Like, but yeah. also like the, the uh, hey, I hated your movie. You want to talk? Yeah, sure. But also like, yeah. when I, so when I'm doing- Or just like, don't the, talk to people when you hate their movie. You know, that's another strategy too. It's yeah. like, hey man, like, like I'm going to pass on the interview. It's just, I didn't really connect to the film, but thanks. thanks. Well, so, well, like the yeah. mo- most of the interviews we do are different than this one. Cause this one was yes. just me, uh, you know, uh, Jason from four five podcast. Listen to that, by the way. Yeah. But, uh, I, We're he, doing he, the top five, uh, uh, stuck in nature films and that comes out in early november oh nice yeah yeah i look forward yeah. to that he, he's a good guy too but like th- this is a little different than most because like most of the time i do interviews it's to promote the movie so when i've agreed yeah. to the interview i haven't seen the movie yet and most oh. of the time most of the time yeah. i kind of know someone who's involved or it looks interesting so i know that i probably sure. at least think this is okay at the very least but there was one time where it's like ugh yeah and that that was a that was a weird interview because like i you know i don't want to talk like like what you were saying like have that conversation about i didn't like your movie let's have this conversation couldn't really yeah. do that and that because it's more of a promo thing so you don't want to come sure out like sure but, yeah you can always say i like the cinematography that's always the line in la when you know they didn't like the movie but they have to say something nice wow amazing cinematography the coloring on this movie is fantastic <laughs> oh, yeah that's awesome <laughs> <laughs> and then you could talk about that that blue that, that one scene just who doesn't like blue <laughs> yeah wow you had right actors on. in this yeah <laughs> they did some work yeah. cool well I, i'm gonna let you go but uh thanks for uh thanks for joining me today and sure man yeah we'll, we'll, we'll have to do this soon and if you ever make your way out to colorado springs hit me up and uh we'll party it up right, right on buddy <laughs>